This video was brought to you by Nebula. Having reported operating losses every year since they started publicly disclosing their finances, Uber has finally entered profitability, reporting a net income of $394 million for the last quarter, compared to a net loss of $2.6 billion in the same quarter of 2022. Now, that's clearly big news for Uber, but it doesn't mean that they're out of the woods just yet. After all, since the company was founded, they've lost a total of $31.5 billion in order to reach this point, earning them the title of the magic money-burning machine, which feels unfair, but with a track record like this, it's pretty hard to argue with. So why has it taken so long for Uber to turn a profit? What finally turned things around? And can this profitability last long enough that they're able to earn back some of that lost 31 billion? Now, as I said, if we ignore the last quarter, Uber has been a massively successful money black hole for some time now, sucking in billions of investor capital and sending it up in smoke. Now, the company was able to rack up these remarkable losses because borrowing money was pretty cheap for them. The past decade or so has been an incredibly good time for unprofitable businesses, with interest rates at record lows, making the job of raising cheap capital relatively easy, especially for a business with the profile of Uber. However, the era of cheap finance seems to have abruptly come to an end, with rocketing interest rates around the world and VC spending slowing in many markets, leaving Uber with a stark problem. They had to begin cutting back on their borrowing and start to actually become profitable. The thing is that this whole challenge might seem a little bit odd, Uber is a pretty dominant player in a massive market, controlling large chunks of both the mobility and delivery space. So how are they burning through quite so much money? Well, part of Uber's profitability problem comes down to its numerous legal cases, but a lot of it is an intentional business strategy. Generally speaking, a loss-leading strategy is when a business sells goods or services for below cost, i.e. losing money for every sale they make. Now, this might sound a bit weird, but it makes sense for two reasons. Firstly, they hope that by selling you a product cheaply, you'll then be tempted to spend more on other products with higher profit margins. Take supermarkets, a type of business with infamously low margins. They regularly sell basic goods like eggs and milk at a loss, hoping that these cheap staples will lure you into the store where you may be tempted to pick up some higher margin items while you're there, like vitamins, coffee, or pre-prepared food. Because, I mean, you're there anyway. The other popular reason to follow a loss leader strategy is to achieve market domination. If you can undercut your competition and push competitors into irrelevance, you're able to dominate the market, jack up prices, and begin to make money. And these strategies aren't mutually exclusive either. Printer companies pretty effectively use both of these strategies in tandem. That's because the big manufacturers sell their printers at such a low price that you're tempted to buy them over other brands. This, in essence, pushes other players out of the market who can't afford to sell their printers for such a low price. And then once you've bought the cheap printer, they've also got you locked in so that they can charge extortionate prices for ink refills, often to the extent that it feels cheaper to just buy a new printer altogether. Going back to Uber, they've also employed this strategy. When Uber first launched, and whenever they enter new markets, they regularly, intentionally offer reduced pricing. Now, that makes sense. It's a strategy that many other businesses use too to try and get you to give them a go. But since Uber's launch, and especially since they've begun to dominate each respective market, many have accused them of jacking up prices because well, once you've tried Uber and you've liked Uber, are you really going to choose anything else? We are, after all, creatures of habit. 
fact. In any case, Uber weren't happy with just a handful of markets either. They wanted them all. And as the FT notes, they quickly embarked on one of the most ambitious global expansions undertaken by any tech startup, tapping mountains of cheap capital to subsidize rides and grab market share. Now, Uber could have saved a considerable amount of time, effort, and cash if they'd focused on a similar market. But its push towards market dominance with a deliberate loss-leading strategy was never isolated to just one single market because they wanted more than just local dominance. They wanted, and continue to want, global dominance. And this has been a broadly successful strategy. Back when they first started, Uber was a cheap and accessible alternative to incumbent taxi and transportation offerings, something that they were happy to boast about in their marketing. But now, with Uber dominating the space, it's not uncommon to see Uber's fares creeping back up to the levels that we saw prior to their entry into the market, pushing back up to those old taxi prices. Now, the company would defend this by saying that increased regulation and lawsuits surrounding their business practices have forced them to increase fares. But it does look like they've just followed a pretty standard playbook, one forged by supermarkets and perfectly followed by fellow tech darling Amazon. That being said, Uber's profitability can't just be attributed to a single policy or pursuit. Many see this as a broader turnaround for the business, with many attributing this success to Uber's CEO, Dara Koshashrari. Koshashrari, previously CEO of Expedia, became the CEO of Uber after its co-founder was forced out of the company. Since becoming CEO, though, Koshashrari has led the company in acting aggressively to rein in costs and raise prices, with subsidized rides and deliveries largely ending as a practice altogether. But while the move to profitability is a big shift for the company, it's not all good news. Uber is still facing increased competition from others in the ride-hailing and delivery sector, notably Lyft and DoorDash. Uber might be able to raise prices due to a lack of competition, but they're not totally alone here. The company has been able to dominate over its competition by using its successful business practices and by breaking down regulation and successfully entering new markets. But the thing is that with the regulation broken down and the barriers smashed, it's also easier for new competitors to follow them. In fact, if you delve deeper into Uber's press release announcing its second quarter results, something other than ride hailing and food delivery jumps out as a major profit area for the company. Advertising. As first reported by marketing trade magazine The Drum, though Uber's increased profits can be attributed to a number of factors, including layoffs and a cutback in discounts and incentives, among the largest influences has been its burgeoning advertising business. That's because in-app advertising has now been added to both its Uber and Uber Eats app, with the company reporting advertising's revenue run rate at over $650 million. So it's clear that there's a number of factors behind Uber's recent success. Their new CEO has put an increased focus on reducing costs and pushing up prices for riders. And they've also clearly benefited from market forces and their increasingly global strategy, as well as a push towards advertising. Whether Uber can continue to be profitable, though, is something that's up in the air. And it's actually what Rory and I discuss in the most recent TLDR daily discussion, breaking down my opinions on whether Uber can remain as profitable as it is today. So you probably remember that first time you used Uber, it felt weirdly cheap. Mm a big moment for yes. uber but it's also well, a big moment for tldr business one of our top channels i uh, mean i don't know yeah. give me the one top, metric top seven. Three. top seven channels one of our it top is. seven channels yeah, yeah 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 stay on me yan don't change that camera if you enjoy diving into topics like this if you're the kind of person who wants the even smarter and more analytical side of these stories then you'll really enjoy our new series the daily discussions where we cover a number of important topics from the endless coups in the sahel region the twitter rebrand and the specifics of the war in ukraine 
Now, the TODR writing team hosts these daily discussions most days, diving deeper into the news stories we write about and unpacking the hidden details that they found fascinating, but were either too long or too academic to make it into the final scripts. If you want to check the series out, then you can find the episodes exclusively on Nebula. The best news is that Nebula is less than £2 a month and provides you with ad-free and exclusive videos from TLDR and a whole ton of other incredible content creators like Johnny Harris, Real Life Law and Legal Eagle. Check it out by clicking the link in the description and make sure you use our link so that they know you came from us.